starting your life. Hello everyone, um, welcome back. I'm Dr. Jean Cacciabato. I am the medical director at Picante Medical Center here in Riverhead, New York. And uh, for those of you that are um, just checking in for the first time, thank you for joining us and for all of you that are back um, week after week uh, again. Thank you for your loyalty. It's great to have you here. Um, we have a really wonderful um, and exciting opportunity um, talking about uh, an aspect of medicine that is not just science, but has um, a, a very good degree of art involved, and that is joint replacement medicine. And I have my esteemed colleague, Dr. Eugene Krauss, who is the um, He's named the founder of the Krauss, um, the Krauss Musculoskeletal Institute, and uh, we're going to be talking about joint replacement surgery. So, Dr. Krauss, welcome. I'm Thank just you. Gonna, Thank everyone you. knows the drill. We're six feet apart. We are wearing our masks as the governor has requested, but so that we can be more interactive, here are our faces. Right. So again, Dr. Krauss, thank, thank you, you so thank you much. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, it's great. I mean, um, uh, for those that may not know all about uh, Pecana Bay Medical Center, it was a small community hospital that served the East End, was founded by the residents of Riverhead uh, 73 years ago, I think. Um, and it has evolved into a regional medical center essentially because of the work that you brought to this building. Um, I, I, I could comment on the history of that a little bit, you know. The, yeah, that would be great, and then we're going to get to our COVID update. Yeah. But yes, no, it's, the it's history is important. You know, I, I came out here, I, it's close to 17 years ago, and, and I, I hate to say what they referred to the hospital at the time, you know, it, it was a uh, you know, central Central General Hospital. No, that's not what they refer to it as. Central, you can say it. You can say it. Central Suffering People, Hospital. We know who we were, and uh, we're not and, that and, person and anymore. It was, you know, in financial difficulty and, and uh, really on the rocks. Um, it's interesting. I, I can tell you the first time that I came, I came at the invitation of Andy Mitchell, who's the CEO. Andy uh, came prior. I, I knew him very well. He was the CEO of Forest Hills Hospital. And I've been working with Northwell Health System and its predecessors now for 33 years. Wow. So, I, you know, I, I knew Andy. He came out here. The place was in difficulty. Uh, and at the time, the chief financial officer, uh, Alan Schechter, who also came from, from Northwell, uh, bumped into me and said, listen, you've you got to come out here. There's, there's, <laughs> we can really use a joint replacement program. <laughs> Later on, perhaps I could explain that joint replacements is a uh, engine for, for hospitals to uh, both to generate revenue and, and uh, patient satisfaction. Uh, you got to come out here and set up the programs. And interestingly enough, when I came the first time, I remember the first time I scrubbed at, at the scrub scene, at that time the chief came up to me and said, I can't believe you're going to do a joint replacement here. I mean, the plate, you're going to get infections, you're going to have problems, we don't have anything. And I said, why would you want to do that? And the answer was simple. There was opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to go places where there was an opportunity. So what was the opportunity at that time? Uh, this was the fastest growing zip code uh, in, on Long Island. People Still were moving out here. Still to this here. day remains yeah. that. And at the time when I uh, proposed to uh, Alan Schechter and Andy Mitchell, you know, what we really need to do is build new ORs. And so, I mean, it's a huge, big project, you know but with big opportunity. And I actually gave a presentation with Andy Mitchell to the, uh, to the local planning board. Uh, and my, you know, they were kind of hesitant, like why would you want another hospital? I mean, literally part of the conversation was, so doctors could make more money? I mean, you know, <laughs> not understanding the reality of, <laughs> the doctor doesn't make money from, from hospitals and so on. But my answer was very really straightforward. It was, the two ways you measure uh, the health of a community is by the quality of the school systems and the quality of its health care. Uh, and people don't want to live in an area, uh, certainly in this area where there's a huge population of 65 or older, but also a growing younger population with neither one of those things so being proper. And certainly healthcare had a big opportunity. Um, and 
you know, if you fast forward, maybe it was four or five years later, um, with the help of the foundation, uh, you know, hundred plus million dollars was raised, and we built this new surgical pavilion. Yeah. Um, and it, it's quite a special place. We'll talk about it being a it's a COVID-free hospital. It, I, I was just going to say because of that hospital within a hospital, it allowed us to maintain a COVID-free space um, that has uh, own entrance, really very much separate. So you, it, it, it is because of you that we had this opportunity well, to, you know, to, the, the to... The place was designed, and, and kind of it's always interesting that in retrospect, you, you, measure, you, know, you measure by outcomes. So you measure in retrospect that what we do you know, 10 years ago, it turns out it's yeah, even better it's than ever for today. Validated. Know? Um, a you know, I, I, Andy remembers. I, I, I sat with Perkins and Easton, were the architectural firm. I actually hired them. They they did the biggest uh, hospital renovations in America, the, the, the billion dollar hospital for uh, uh, John Hopkins. They, they mm -hmm. designed and so on. Uh, they designed the facility. And so, what we have here on the second floor, I mean, it's a hospital within a hospital. It yeah. totally runs independently. Yep. On the second floor, there's six state-of-the-art operating rooms. They're unique to Long Island. Um, they are laminar flow rooms. Uh, most people don't know what that is, but I can explain that. Yeah. Um, later on, you mentioned I was an aerospace engineer. Yes. So, so when, when you design and assemble parts, historically, in my, old, in my old field, that have to go into totally dust-free environments, then you create a room where the air conditioning is totally filtered twice, and then it comes down as a sterile column of air. Here it's over the operating room, there it's over workstation, mm -hmm. and gets sucked out along the floor. So there's no recirculating of the air, there's no turbulence, you're not scattering dust from the floor and recirculating it. So all the air in those operating rooms come down totally sterile yep. and gets sucked out along the floor. And, and again, uh, another really wonderful in today's environment world is, to have in a virus-laden yeah, concern. In, in, in so. today's world, it's like, oh, that was great that we did that. I mean, it, those operating rooms, just for the uh, laminar flow, uh, which is uh, the, the only ones on Long Island, just for that alone was uh, several millions of dollars for additional cost. Yeah. So the second floor has those state-of-the-art operating rooms, all electronic, all state-of-the-art. And on the first floor, we have a separate unit, 18 single private rooms, mm -hmm. each one with a separate uh, bathroom, Spacious, and, a, and a separate uh, physical therapy area. Yeah. Uh, so patients get, they come in, they go upstairs, they get surgery, they come downstairs, they go into a private room in a private unit, not mixed in with other hospital patients, get their physical therapy, and we can talk later on. I mean. The majority of patients go home the next day or in two days. Yeah, I happen to operate on Fridays here. They go home Saturday or Sunday. It's it's very convenient. It, it's perfect. I mean, the process that was mapped out in you know with your architects is the process that has served us so well in this time. And so, as we um, talk about you know hospitals and COVID and. Anyone who watches TV, uh, there's a lot of commercials out on many healthcare systems and, and practices uh, assuring safety, which is absolutely the case. The hospitals are safe. Um, you need to see your physicians. You need to do prevention. Um, but the question then is, is this the time to do a joint so, replacement? So we can talk about that. So I, I think it's a good time. But before I answer, is this a good time in the hospital? Let me just step back for a second and see the real, what the indications are. Wh uh, why does any patient yeah. decide to have a joint replacement? And, then is, it, and then is it good for them? Mm -hmm. So the indications are very straightforward. I mean, uh, I've written a number of articles on that. You know, it's an x-ray that shows us what out. I mean, I, I, if I want to give a simplistic mechanical uh, uh, analogy, we're not changing the tire unless there's no tread that's on the rim. Here is no problem. <laughs> bone gets hard. I mean, it sounds... City, but it, it, so that you know, the radiographic findings have to be it's worn yes. out. The joint is worn out, whether it's a hip or a knee. Uh, second indication is that the fact that that process is affecting the quality of life of the patient. It stops patients from 
dropping, dancing, traveling, exercising, playing golf, tennis, wearing high heels, all the stuff that they like to do. Yep. Yeah. And the third indication is the patient who is healthy enough to serve. So an intelligent doctor starts backwards with, is the patient healthy enough to serve? Right. So, and I'll talk about this yeah. facility as well. So healthy enough, you know, I, I'm not the decision maker, nor should the patient be. Right. It's the medical team that does that. So, you know, uh, although I would say healthy enough in the last six or seven years, I've done at least 50 patients every single year above 90 years old. Wow. I got a letter yesterday, a beautiful letter, lady I did both her knee replacements at 95, she had 101. Wow. Um, so, you know, but she was a healthy 95. So, you know, so there I tell patients, okay, you know, all the patients have some cardiac issues, some, you know, they're on a blood thinner, they have a pacemaker, they've had a stent, they've had, you know, yeah, they're the years out. accumulate, right. so, but, problems right. accumulate. <laughs> but the way to get you to 90 healthy and happy is to maintain your mobility. Yes. Right? So the more sedentary, the worse you are, you become medically. So, you know, medically uh, healthy, you know, we are coordinating everything with the patients medical team, medical doctor, cardiologist, pulmonologist, sleep apnea, endocrinologist, 30 or 40% of the patients have you know, diabetes, heart right. disease, and so on. Yeah. Uh, what is interesting I was gonna say about this particular facility is that it also now is a huge cardiac center. And interestingly enough, I do a lot of high-risk patients. And I'm doing high-risk patients that live in Brooklyn that I tell them, you need to drive out to Peconic because I can have you cleared by the cardiac team, even though you have a cardiologist someplace in Brooklyn, yes. but he's not here in the hospital. And uh, you, you know, I've, de I've dealt with you and with yes. Stan Katz and with the whole team, and I can do a, a, a hip replacement or a knee replacement, and patient comes to the recovery room, and the cardiologist is standing by the bedside yes. waiting for them. Knows their whole story, has coordinated everything with their medical team, with their cardiologist, and so it's seamless. So. I'm just going to interject sure. because uh, it is a uh, clearly an important piece, especially for a patient that does have a stem. Sorry, I can't help myself being the cardiologist. Yeah. Um, so you, you can stay on all of your antiplatelet therapy, and so there is a concern always that something can go awry in the cardiac arena and a, and a stent may not stay open in a high stress situation. It's incredibly rare, so we never anticipate that. But should it happen, to know that literally down the hallway is a cardiac catheterization lab that can come in and allow the surgery to, to take place and, and in real time um, address the cardiac issue and restore a blockage if that was the case. And so it is the ideal location it, it, for it that. It hasn't happened thing. emergently, it, it, but nevertheless, you it, know. Uh, it, 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 is an, it is a rare yeah. event. I'm not gonna say it's a never event because I have taken no, no, care of, of patients, but the, the most important thing is like every, every good Boy Scout, you wanna be prepared. And this building, the facility, the way it's been designed allows absolute preparedness and responsiveness to any situation, really. You know, I, I, I tell you, I was an aerospace engineer for 12 years. Yes, I, I love engineer. that. I'll, I'll talk about that. Yeah. I, but, you know, um, failures always occur because of failures of the system and the backup system and the backup system. Mm -hmm. So although you fly every day safely, you want to have a parachute just in case. So, yeah. you know, I mean, so we have here uh, an orthopedic hospital within a hospital, and we have all of the backup that yep. just in case. A lot of so, fail safes. So if the patient has, you know, uh, you know, is a good candidate, you know, they're, they're medically okay, they have a bad x-ray, the, then the real question is, the real indicator that makes the patient decide to have a joint replacement is, it's enough, it's affecting the quality of my life. I mean, today I told a dozen patients at least, you know, uh, that I'd seen a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, they come in today and they go, you need to fix my knee. Yeah. But what changed is the fact is quality of life is eroded away. For some people, they're very, very fearful. fearful. They say, I'm never gonna have a joint replacement. They call me back a year later, you need to do this yeah, right away. Yeah, can't take it. That, that's what I always tell my patients. I'm like, you'll know, you'll know well, when it's, it's time. It, you know, if for some people, it's like, if I can't play golf and I can't go shopping and I can't go, you know, yeah. to the city, then I need to have this fixed, which is true. Yep. I mean, it's easier if they do it earlier, but 
It's still doable. I tell all the patients, I mean, the good news for me is I'm not in the world of cancer or heart disease. I can do just as good a job at this point, like I'm the 95 year later. I mean, she could have had it done 10 years earlier, but she had a good outcome. So very controlled setting. You, you know, your, your operating right. room. Yes. Oh, and we'll talk about that. So so if the patient has that real indication, you know, their knee or their hip is affecting the quality of life, then is it a good time today because we, the whole world is sensitized with post-COVID mm -hmm. or, or intra-COVID, depending on where you are. And, right. Uh, yeah, it, in the country. It ain't, it, it ain't over till it's over, you know. Um, so... I think it's a very good time. Why? Uh, we have this unique setup where it's a hospital within a hospital. So how does that really work for the patient and so on? Uh, first of all, all of our patients are screened ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, this hospital, this building is COVID free. It was never occupied by COVID patients. No. Not There's no surgery in the operating room, there's nobody in the recovery room, and our unit was never occupied by COVID patients. Correct. That being said, it was all super sterilized. Correct. And that sterilization process is not just like we're going to wipe everything down. Did the guy do a good job? I mean, there's special people with hazmat suits with all this really f difficult. Uh, yeah, virucidal, antivirucidal materials. Yeah. Like that they scrub everything, and then all of the softwoods were replaced. I mean, you know, you don't have the same, you know, curtains or drapes and no. whatever. Everything thrown out. Everything replaced. You know. And then two kinds of robots to sterilize. There's, there's a, one particular robot that is uh, using very intense ultraviolet light. Uh, it, it could be dangerous if you're next to it. It goes in a room, you close the door, it spends a half hour Oh, the there. purple sun robot. The pur purple sun robot, yeah. Uh, and then there's another robot that ionizes it, like microscopic particles of disinfectant. And it gets into the air conditioning, into the lights and so on, and then you can't go in the area for a period of time. And then the place is sterile. Yeah. yeah. Now, all of our patients are tested two days before. Uh, two to three days. We extended yeah. it a little so, bit. But we do we, ask them to isolate once they're tested, so we, we're we, confident. We, we know that they're meeting. really negative because we're not doing the quick test. We're doing the real test. So it's yes. not like people have heard of false negatives. How do you know it's really negative? No, this is a very definitive test. If it's negative, it's negative. We've, we've, when Patty was here at our um, session two weeks ago, I think, we talked about the expanded PCR as the most uh, sensitive and specific test. So that, that is the test that every patient is getting. And then nobody's coming in and out of the building unless they're authorized to be here. They have a special card to swipe in. We have a separate entrance. And so the patient gets tested. They come into the hospital. You know, everybody, everything is sterile. They have the surgery. They go to a unit that's never been occupied and it's sterilized anyway, and they go home in a day or two. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I think it's a good time because we are uh, super sensitive to it. But I would tell you that my patients that I've been seeing in the last four weeks, I've been operating, I mean, pretty extensively actually. The most, there's there's two patient populations that are coming in. Okay. There's a lot of people that have waited a long time and then all of a sudden they're kind of stuck in their house, they're not doing much, and they realize that life is going by and things are getting worse. And they've come in and said, Dr. Krauss, I would have had it done in March, I must say in March and April, I stopped op operating March 11th, from March 11th till May 27th, I had 112 cases booked in one hospital and 42 at the other, 150 joint replacements all of which we cancel and we we'll reschedule. We we'll reschedule a lot of them. Um, and so patients are coming in and saying, look, uh, I need to get it done. Yeah. And you know, so we are, we're working full time. Uh, and if they get it done in July, August, they still enjoy the nice weather, they're out walking. From the point of view, you know, of my, it's best to do it when you can go out and walk and do things and, and, right. and enjoy it. Yeah, you need to recover and use that yeah. new joint. Walking is the number one it's therapy. Best, best. Now, the, the other side, I, I have had patients today also that came in and said, look, I mean, I want to have it done, but you know, my business is just opening up again. Can I put this off till September or October? I mean, I've, I've booked I don't know, 80 or 90 patients in September, October, November, you know, 
Um, and the good news is I can still do a good job. But it's not like like the cancer that you've right. neglected and then you've missed the boat, you know. Yeah. So it, it, it still is a, a good time. So the real decision making process, how much is affecting quality of my life? I used to tell people if it was me, I'd figure where's a convenient time in my life, mm -hmm. you know. The school teachers will want to have it done right when school is done, you know, and the accountants you have to tax season and you know, but I would do it and then fix it. Right. And we can talk about joints because it's not a band aid today. It's a, it's a real solution. It is absolutely. Um, I just want to take a pause for those of you that are just joining us. Welcome. I'm Dr. Jean Cacciabato. I'm the medical director at the Connick Bay Medical Center. With me today is Dr. Eugene Krauss. He is the founder of the Krauss Musculoskeletal Institute, which is the service that uh, provides our joint replacement surgery here at Peconic Bay Medical Center. And we've been talking about joint replacement surgery. We kind of just reviewed um, the indications and, and what Dr. Krauss is seeing in his own practice as we recover and emerge out of the COVID surge here in New York. and. Uh, you know, it's, it sounds like it's been some interesting conversations that you've had with your patients. Um, didn't even really consider the idea that they're returning to their businesses, and now that's another... For, for, for some people, you know, it's really, unfortunately, it's an economic decision, yes. it's a stress situation. But, you know, uh, look, a joint replacement today is not something that you say, well, I woke up this morning, my knee's painful, and I'm going to have it replaced. A joint replacement uh, is, you know, let me just explain. People have this idea that I have arthritis in my knee, I don't complain. You have arthritis and you're complaining a lot. How come you need a joint and I don't? Right. So maybe I'll back up for a second. Itis means inflammation of, arthro means joint, but it's like a long movie. It starts out with inflammation, <laughs> you know, and then the cartilage starts to deteriorate and then cartilage tears and then it's bone against bone and then it, it needs an implant. Right. Uh, and one person is the beginning of the movie and the other one is at the end. And people start to realize that it's been going on for a while and they're crossing more and more things off the list. Mm -hmm. So a joint replacement uh, in today's world is first of all not what it sounds like. I just want to jump to the end for a second. It's a solution that lasts 25, 30, 35 years. I, I saw just the other day a patient, 27 year follow up. Wow. And thought they needed the, the plastic artificial cart was replaced. It looked terrific. I told her to come back in five years and I'll check it again. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a real solution. It's, it's not a, not a band. Thing. But, you know, let me just start by just saying a, a knee replacement, the, first of all, the words total joint replacement is enough to terrify anybody. And I think that many people stay away saying, I, I'm not having that. I mean, I've had people say to me, I, I really don't want to have a, a transplant. Right. You know, uh, so, just if we thought about total knee replacements, uh, it's a misnomer. It's not what it is. Uh, it's really a resurfacing of your own bone. And this is where the art comes into it all. The art of explaining. And I, I, the art of explaining, but the art of doing. I, I, Dr. Krauss uh, spends an afternoon with me and showed me, um, you know, moment by moment how he assesses. And it, there's, there's some sculpting involved, I would say. Just remind me after that, I would comment on the art of medicine versus the technology okay. and, and how they're related. Um, so a knee replacement today is a resurfacing. It, it's more analogous, more similar to if you have an erosion in the tooth, the dentist would do an inlay. So it's an inlay into the bone with an artificial plastic cartilage. We are not replacing muscles, ligaments, tendons, arteries, nerves, skin. It's your own knee. Yeah. It's a resurfacing. I can tell you, done in the hands of highly experienced people, and one of the issues in America today is still 50, 60, 70% of joint replacements are being done by a general orthopedic surgeon who's doing one a week, one a month, fixes a broken ankle, a broken finger, a broken wrist, puts a cast on, and says, I can do your knee replacement. It's a totally different uh, operation if you're doing three, four, five hundred a year. I, I personally do a thousand a year. Uh, so th there is a lot to be said for the experience uh, and being a bigger and bigger expert in a smaller and smaller area. I mean, not a jack of all trades. I mean, I personally only do hip and knee replacements. 
and, and that's what people should be doing if they're doing joint replacements. So yeah. all of our joint replacement surgeons, Dr. Michael Simonello and Dr. Peter Sultan, this is what they do. You brought them here. I, I, I've helped to recruit them. They, they're they're terrific guys. They're both super well trained. And, super, and, and also also super busy as well. Yeah, but. And, and, and that's the way it should be. Yeah. Meaning that you, you, you want to be a bigger and bigger expert in a smaller and smaller area. So that, you know, I, I had an old professor, I went to Columbia Medical School, and he said to me, you know, if you do that, your coronary arteries will live longer and your patients will do better. Uh, and at first I thought, okay, I want to do a little bit of everything, you know, variety is the spice of life, you know. But in reality, uh, for this type of work, smaller and smaller area of expertise. We've been saying a couple of times while we've been together how you were originally an aeronautic engineer. And so for, for me, after you walked me through your procedure, it seemed like a, a, a perfect transition. Like, you know, to aerospace, this joint space that now so, gets. I'll, I'll give you a one minute background. Yeah, I, we're, we're so, curious I, about that transition. So, so I, I went to school, Columbia Medical School, and I trained in hospital special surgery. And uh, that's okay. I mean, I, you know, I, I, have to be, I have to be honest with you. I, I really don't view other institutions as competition. Actually, if you look at, you know, I mean, there's a major difference here. I'll just, since you touched on it, I'll mention it, you know. All my patients ask me, Dr. Kraus, do you actually do the surgery? I said, absolutely. I make the decision. I'm there for the entire operation. Yes, this, is a, this is a non-teaching program. What not everybody understands is that in a teaching program, the resident or the fellow must do part of the case. And often I look at an x-ray and I go, I, I know that the guy that's supposed to do it didn't do it. Mm -hmm. it can't do it. It's just not right. Mm -hmm. uh, here, uh, this is a non-teaching program. Everybody in the operating room has to write on all the forms. Dr. Kraus was here for the entire operation, did all the critical steps, but they're all personally in trouble. <laughs> I used to kid around, I say to my patients, when they ask me, I can get one nurse to lie once, but not five nurses to lie a thousand times. Right. You know, so clearly we do the surgery. Yes. And that has a lot to I do with, Yeah, that has a lot to do with the outcomes uh, uh, as well. But a, a knee replacement or a hip replacement today done by the subset of doctors who are really experts in doing this, yeah is 40, 45 minutes um, under regional anesthesia. Regional is just like when you go to the dentist, he makes you very numb. So, you know, uh, a little bit of Novocaine, long acting on the front and on the back on the nerve roots. The knee is numb. You get all nervous, am I gonna be awake? No, no, we can give you some sedation, like when you're having a colonoscopy, you could be snoring away. You could think that you're, you know, under anesthesia, right. but you don't need, you do not need it tube and a respirator and general anesthesia. So you're not confused, you're not nauseous, you're not knocking off brain cells. Right. All the patients are out of bed two hours after surgery, getting physical therapy the same day. Not because we're torturing them, but because the newest of technologies, we're infusing the muscles and the ligaments with long acting pain medication. That has changed and evolved over the years. So if you ask somebody what happened five years ago, it's totally different totally. today, much better. Patients are out of bed the same day. They can move their knee right away. They don't need, need machines to bend their knee back and forth. They can actively move them. And as I said, you know, most patients go home in one or two days, not because we're throwing them out. Right. This, this is a very friendly, very cooperative hospital. I, I tell my patient, nobody will keep you too long nor throw you out too soon. But at one day or two days, people are walking 100, 150 feet up and down the hall and go home. Right. And we have a seamless program where we send uh, a physical therapist from our program to the patient's to home their homes. for up to 10 days afterwards. And after that, they re they're not bed bound, they get out of bed, they walk around, they go out in the garden, they go out in the neighborhood. Uh, not the restaurants today, you want to be safe, <laughs> but they can go out. Um, and uh, after that, we go to outpatient physical therapy. The, the program that Dr. Krauss referred to, our home care, which brings um, physical therapy experts into your home, Hospital for Special Surgery has discovered them, and they are also using our home care program um, for the patients that recover here on the East End and perhaps their summer homes or, or, or family members. So uh, um, recognition 
we, yeah. we started talking about this, and Merle Siegel, who is the head of all home care, yes. uh, and Irene Mitzner, are both people that I know really well, they're just wonderful. We started talking 10 years ago about why do people have to go to nursing homes afterwards? Uh, and the reason that back then was that uh, they only allowed Medicare for a therapist to come to the house once or twice a week. Today, you know, first ten days every day. And the technology has gotten so much better that people are really mobile. They're out of bed and walking around. Yeah. Today, I told my, I, I had about five patients post up from, from two weeks ago. I told the, 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 the spouse, yeah. less sympathy. <laughs> yeah. But they need a glass of water, they go to the kitchen, get it themselves, you know, because they're out of bed and walking. Yeah. yeah. So, so let, let, let me just comment a little bit on the, the art of medicine versus technology. A um, hundred years ago, you know, there was no technology. Doctors had only the art of medicine, and yet, you know, doctors were an important part of your family life. Mm -hmm. Even when somebody was really sick and going to expire, the doctor was very important because the art of medicine helped make the family better. Uh, you know, they had the best of stethoscope, you know, no CAT scan, no MRIs, no big tests, you know, and yet... Their hands? Right, their hands. And their hearts. Right. But the powers of observation and of understanding human behavior were very important. Mm -hmm. uh, my first rotation at uh, clinical rotation at uh, Columbia Medical School, um, I had the chief of medicine, uh, and he told me to meet him up on the ward. It was an 18 bed ward in, in those days. And we walked up to the first patient, and he said, All right, what can you tell me about the patient? What do they got? And I reached to the chart, I go, Why are you looking at the chart? Why are you not looking at the patient? Um, and we spent the whole hour there, him at, grilling me about what do I see in the patient and what am I, I you know. He said, we'll, we'll get to the chart in three more visits, you know. Uh, and so, you know, you, you walk into the examining room, and if you're, you're an experienced doctor, and you've been through this a lot, you understand immediately what are the issues involved. You hear a little bit of the background of, you know, what are the medical issues, and you need to kind of treat the whole patient. That has a lot to do with the art of medicine. Uh, how do you take a person who you're looking at their x-ray and you know they really, they really need to have this fixed? Right. Because all of a sudden, they're there with their walker, you know, they're 74 years old, and you know the next step is going to be a, a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Or it's the guy that s says to you, I'm only 57 years old, but I put on 50 pounds because I, 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 can't, I yeah, don't go to the gym anymore, I don't do this, I don't do that, I'm, I can't go to work and so on. You know, how do you take the person who is heard the words total hip or total knee replacement and can conjure up some story of his aunt who had it done 20 years ago who had some terrible outcome <laughs> and so on and this is said to die for him of why he's not having this done you know and how do you spend enough time to explain to them what a knee replacement is and enjoy them in the fact that you feel comfortable enough to make sure that they're going to have a good outcome uh, without without schmoozing them I mean you know a knee replacement is not as good as your knee was when you were 12 or 15 years old. But it's damn good. I mean, you can right. go back to playing tennis and racquetball and hiking and, I mean... Pain free. I, I, I have a, a gentleman with two knee replacements who's climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I mean, I have a whole bunch of stories like that. It depends how feisty you are in the first place. Right. You know? So, you know, uh, so the art of medicine of being able to enjoy the patient and make them feel comfortable uh, and explain to them and then to bring them through the process is perhaps as important as the technology. I, I feel that during COVID, the art of medicine yeah. was very present um, at every bedside, with every nursing interaction, every physician interaction, um, because we were so aware that the patient was in this building alone and that we had to be their, their caregivers, their loved ones, and, and, and then deliver all of this information back to their loved ones who was waiting at home for the information. And so it was nice to see the resurgence of the relationships and the trust the building. Many can take away the MRI machine or the whatever as a solution for, you know, right. what, what do I got done? Then it's all about the, the automatic. So I must, must say though, the, the other side to it is that, I don't know, 
to sound too uh, self promoting here. I mean, I, it's not my goal. Uh, I, I've done 25. You're my only guest today. So well, you, you know, I, you know I, I've done 25,000 drugs with patients. It's a number that if you say this to another doctor, I'll say, I must be exaggerating. You know, it's not the, the doctors do, it, you know, in the community or out there, if they're doing 50 to 75 a year, they, you know, they're players, you know. Uh, so there is something comforting, you know, when you look at a certain kind of, you look at an x-ray go like, this is fixable, this doesn't yeah. matter, you know. And, and patients say, well, have you ever, you know, but you know, I, I, I had a torn cartilage or I had my ligament reconstructed, I've seen 3,000 of those, you know. Right. <laughs> 9,000 of the other kind of problem and so on, you know. Or, or medically, you know, uh, you know, you know, I've got six stents and they tell me this and I go, well, you know, we've got lots of patients. So we got this. Right. So then the art of medicine becomes easier because it's based on, for me it's 33 years, but based on a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. You can say, look, uh, you, 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 for, the, for the patient, it's a unique process. It's a one-off, maybe two, you know, uh, eventually. But, you know, but for the doctor, he can convey his... Perhaps four. I, I, <laughs> I, I, tell you, knees, I, I, I tell you, I did a 95 year old. Actually, I, I this letter that I got, I did both her hips in her 80s and I did both her knees in her 90s. So, <laughs> so yeah, it can be four. But uh, uh, the, the, I should say, the nicest letter I got from this lady was at age 100. She wrote me a letter and said, I'm doing great. I'm still walking a mile every morning, but I can do two miles if Johnny Walker is waiting for me. <laughs> 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 so she had a good sense of humor as well. It speaks to the relationship yeah, that you yeah, built. Yeah, I, yeah. I'll just share the, the Foley family when they saw on the internet that we were doing this today, uh, quickly reached out to us and, and mentioned how you are part of their family and have done many of the family's joints. <laughs> so. So, so, so let me just say, just comment on that as well. Um, all the joy in, in doing a joint replacement comes from the post-operative period. Patients come to you after, they, they say, you know, I danced at my daughter's wedding, I went to uh, walk on the Great Wall of China, I, you know, I did the, all the things that I always wanted to do because you res restored their mobility and so on. So bring uh, your bucket list to Dr. Krauss and he will <laughs> make sure that it is filled. I, you know, if we had several hours, I would tell you several stories, but you know, <laughs> uh, but no, but that, that's where the, the, the pleasure comes. Uh, and. If you know that the technology, I mean, hip replacements and knee replacements are among the best operations ever invented by mankind, as far as reproducible, reliable outcomes. And we can talk about the technology if you, if you would like. I'd, I'd love to kind of talk about um, where we're heading and where we're going. And, and just for those of you that are out there, if you have any questions that you want to um, type in, we'll be happy to bring them to Dr. Krauss so you can get his opinion, but... Um, what, what is our time like? How much time do we have? So I'm going to... 20 minutes. Well, we have three stars. Yeah, time, so. we have plenty of time. So Dr. Krauss is um, a member of uh, innovation teams and uh, several I, I, of the... I, I can comment on it. Though. Yeah, well, let's, so, let's, no, I, let's I hear was, about what I, the future is So I said that I was like. a, 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 an aerospace engineer. Uh, Actually, it's interesting because I became an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, you may even know the name. There's a, there's a famous uh, Charlie Neer who invented the toe shoulder. He really was the first modern day orthopedist to do shoulder replacement. Which is not an easy joint. Not easy. And, and I did a, 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 he was at Columbia Medical School, and I did a rotation with him. And I had, the last thing I wanted to do was be an orthopedic surgeon. I thought <laughs> I wanted to do research uh, <laughs> in diabetes, you know. And so I did a rotation with him, and he, he came with a very technical, difficult problem uh, at the time, and I gave him a, a really easy mechanical solution. And he goes, uh, what are you going to do? I said, I'm, I'm going to do research on diabetes. And he goes, uh, forget about that. I'm going to be an orthopedic <laughs> surgeon. Um, uh, I, I was a practicing aerospace engineer for 12 years. He said, why would you want to waste all of that? You know? So uh, orthopedics is very mechanical oriented size to that. Uh, a lot of the technology in orthopedics and in medicine in general has come from the aerospace uh, industry. I mean, if people have heard when airplanes crash, they do what's called a root cause analysis. They look at all of the reasons why it crashed. So, you know, the, the same thing here in, in, in medicine. Today, 
that comes from the aerospace uh, business. Uh, is, uh, you, you want to make sure that what was the sequence of events, not so much to blame somebody, but to learn from it and how you change. Right. And the other part is, you know, the field that I was in, uh, uh, I actually was, uh, we had a family business, we owned and operated a company that made aerospace instrumentation. Uh, my brother was an engineer, my father was a tool and die maker. Uh, and when I entered the business, we started to do gyroscopes. And so gyroscopes are instruments that they have to be perfect. I mean, otherwise the airplane drifts off course. You know? So the question is, how do you do it? You know, a thousand gyroscopes, every one perfect, but you break it down to very small steps, mm -hmm. and each step gets quality assured. Now, if you translate that to medicine, we're doing the same thing. If you look at our program today, it's very elaborate. You have a question? We have a question that just came in uh, I'll, I'll when you're done. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it, it, it's very enough. So, so we're not just saying, important. great, you need a drug replacement, we'll book you, and so on. I mean, we have a whole team, you know, nurse practitioners, clinical pharmacists, you know, the whole medical team. I mean, everybody is checking to make sure that every step is quality assured. So, you know, we're not taking you off unless we get a, a clearance from everybody. Yeah. Right. And so, and, and the surgery is designed that way as well. It's, it's very neat, very methodical, very reproducible. And then finally, the implants today are, you know, they're really space age materials. Maybe I'll answer the question. Yeah, let's take our questions before talk about, we talk about the implants. And then I'll talk about the new implants. So the first person asked if Dr. Krause is specific to the knee. So if I, I, I do both, both knees and hips. Great. Uh, More opportunities <laughs> to be with him. So, in my career, I've, I, I've mentioned I've done actually more than 25,000 drug replacements. It's about half and half, although at this point in the world, there's more needs to be done. If you look at worldwide sales of joints, it's about 60% knees and 40% hips. And if you look at my practice, because it's such a big number, 1,000 a year, it's roughly 60% knees and 40% hips, but more than 10,000 hips is the answer. And that same person had a follow-up question to ask if your device that you're using, the product, is different than um, than any others. Is it a specific? No. So, but, I, but, I, but that leads into what's perfect segue question. What's new and different about the? Uh, so let me step backwards for a second. First of all, um, implants have many many different price levels. It sounds strange, but just like you can buy a car, which is, you know, I don't say like a Volkswagen, you know, or, you can, or like a Rolls Royce, that there's a difference in the quality and there's a difference in the durability and so on. So if you look at, let's say, a hip replacement, just as an example, it can be any place from $1,800 for the cheapest that's available in the world to, you know, $8,000 if it's among the most expensive and best in the world. There are things about it that make it better if you get to the top of the line implant from every one of the four or five major implant manufacturers, they're all excellent. There's a difference, but they're all excellent. Uh, and there's a difference in the technology. Now, the interesting part about patients have this feeling, and I once gave a talk, and I said, do you think that the doctor chooses your implant, and do you think that you pay for the implant? And the answer was, yes, I, the doctor must make that decision, and I guess, I wound up paying for it through my insurance and so on. Neither one of the questions, uh, the answer was correct. Um, at this hospital, Northwell Health System and, and, and also the other hospital that I operate, part of Northwell, um, we are not restricted as far as the quality of the implant. Uh, we can use the best, most expensive implant. It's covered by people's insurance. The hospital has a fixed amount of money for their entire uh, episodic care, meaning from the time they enter the hospital till they leave the hospital, and the cost of the implant is is included. Now, this I won't name specific hospitals, but most of the hospitals that are either economically stressed or economically greedy, uh, uh, then there's a question of the purchasing department is controlling what's going on. Uh, three New York City hospitals where I know them very well, I've been asked to, to try to recruit me to be chief at various places. They'll say, you can use whatever you want, but not more than $4,000. Purchasing department is determined. So you can use brand A, B, or C, or D, but not the top of the line. 
the ortho has not done that. They are more focused on uh, patient satisfaction and outcomes. That's how you rebuild programs in the long run. And, and the issues with that are, is the patient may not even know if it's the best implant or not, because you're not going to find that out in the first year, two, or three. I mean, you may find out if you have a significant problem. But reality, if you look at other countries, let's say like Great Britain, where hip replacements were invented, 1957 by Charlie. I, I actually was a consultant to the Wrightington Hospital where hip patients were invented. That was a consultant to the British National Health Service. Day number one, among the things that he invented was the hip replacement, how to do it in a sterile room, but also what's called a registry. Every joint done in Great Britain from 1957 is on the same computerized system. The hospital doesn't get paid unless they enter all the data, so they know which implant lasts longer. So if you tell them I use a ABC stem, they go, oh, our data shows it lasts 12 years. Uh, the other stem happens to last 15 years, uh, and the other you know, uh, uh, bearing lasts 22 years. They know that based on historic data. So we're using implants that, last, you know, that have the best materials uh, uh, and the most expensive. Uh, I have a question that is asked often when you say, is it unique? The, the hip replacement, for example, that I'm using at the moment uh, is an implant that I've been uh, involved with the design of. Uh, I'd just like to clarify that you know, people think I'm the inventor, I'm the designer. I'm, a, I, I, I'm let's say, the more senior member on a uh, design team. Uh, I have uh, been involved with the design of two hip replacements and two knee replacements for two of the four biggest implant makers in the world. I, I am I'm live, so I'm supposed to disclose that I get royalties, nearly a percent on worldwide sales I've gotten on, on four implants. But I, the disclaimer on that is that all of the royalties have gone into a tax-free foundation, and I spent it on indigent patient care. If people Google my name, they'll see I've, I've operated in Africa multiple times. Uh, and, and our presentation, both when I owned the office and now since it's Northwell since 2012, is we, if, if Northwell accepts your insurance, I get paid by Northwell. I, I personally, when I was in private uh, practice for 30 years, my mantra is I accept all patients all insurance. There's no money, there's no charge. Now if I get you into the hospital, there's no issue. So we You see, we're using you see the, the patient. You, you see the patient um, as a person and not as a... I, I, you know, I, I'm amazed, you know, one of my patients, I offered I get off the table, went down to any missions office, wrote on a check for a million dollars. You know, I said, I'm very happy with the care. I wouldn't have a clue whether the guy had, <laughs> was an indigent person or a wealthy person. I don't know. And it doesn't really matter. Yeah, Outcome. Okay. Implant is the same. But to come back to the implants, two, two things. Uh, implants today are designed to fit the bone better and reproduce the motion better. So what people don't quite know is that big manufacturers are hesitant to change their design, to design a newer implant. Why? Because A, they have the, the instruments to put the implant in are expensive, about $150,000 for a set of instruments. So a program like ours has 15 sets of instruments, you know, two and a half, three million dollars worth of it. The manufacturers give you that. So they don't make any money on selling you implants for a number of years. Once they've amortized that, then it's a very good product for them. You know, the first two, three years out. So if you're a huge big company and you've got 10,000 sets of instruments out there at $150,000 each, you're not, uh, every time you design a new implant, you need new instruments to put it in. So, but today, there are companies, for example, there's a company that has a million CAT scans of your of people's hips and of their knees in their data bank. You can write a computerized algorithm to analyze how does the bone change its shape so you can make an implant that fits the bone better. In the knee, it reproduces the motion better. In the hip, you need to machine less bone, take less bone away, all of which makes the surgery you know, less, less machining, less bleeding, less pain, faster outcomes, I mean, so the newer implants, you know, are designed to reproduce motion and, and, and to fit the bone better. And we, I mean, I, I'm using implant, the new replacement that I'm using was designed two and a half years ago. It's the fastest growing 
uh, new replacement in America, four asked the court. I'm, I'm not the only person involved in that. I, I may be the most senior person on the committee. There's 20 engineers. I mean, there's a half a billion dollars behind it. I mean, you know, but it's, uh, and everything that we're using here, everything that we're using is made in America, FDA approved. I, I personally have not used an implant in 33 years that's ever had a recall. Perfect. Uh, while we're talking about implants, um, there was a time where there were gender-specific mm -hmm. um, implants. It's evolved a little bit, right? It's, it's, it's a misnomer. Okay. So I, I, I'll give you the yeah, answer to that. Talk about that. I won't use names of companies. So there's a company, actually my old professor uh, in the 1980s uh, designed an implant then for a knee, and basically there were four sizes, small, medium, large, extra large. I mean, you know, you, you fell in between, the teaching was, We'll downsize to the side. You know, you are between a medium and a large. We'll give you a medium. You know, it's not good if you're buying shoes that way. But uh, <laughs> and it's not good if you put a knee pad. So then, you know, a company, uh, you know, fast forward a number of years, and then finally somebody said, you know, this is crazy. We, we need in between. Let's, like, men are bigger, women are, you know, smaller. Small. Maybe we need different sizes, uh, uh, which is also not correct. We'll talk about that. So we'll make in between sizes. You know. Uh, large minus, large plus, medium minus, medium plus, you know, basically some in-between sizes. And the, you know, the, the medium minus is a woman's knee, the medium plus is a man's knee, you know. Oh, uh, interesting. I, I would say, I mean, I, I, some of my patients come as far as, I mean, India, Japan, you know. You know, sometimes you have a tiny little Japanese guy that, you know, if I tell him he got a woman's knee, you know, they're very macho, you can't, you can't, <laughs> you know, like I tell you, you got a, really solid man's knee, you know. <laughs> you know uh, so, again, fast forward a number of years. So, a company came along and said, listen, we can kind of custom make them so we'll make it exactly to fit your knee. But that doesn't work either. I mean, I was involved with some of that. Because, first of all, you can't have just one of something. What if it doesn't fit just right? You know? Right. And what if the nurse dropped it on the floor? I mean, you know, you're not in the, you know, let's say, let's order another one and so on. So, if you, if you look at what we're doing here today, for example, you know, I'm using millimeter sizes. Some people refer to it as patient-matched implants. Mm -hmm. It's really not. It's, if I, me I, I make an incision, I measure, and if you're 71 millimeters, you're getting 71. Mm -hmm. no. You're not getting 70 or 75. I'm not telling the sales rep, bring in uh, kind of a medium-sized person, bring me a you know, 70, 75 in the Navy. I have 70, 71, 72. Not only each one. I have 20 of each one of them uh, sitting here. We have several millions of dollars worth of implants sitting here. And that's why you want to go to a center that's doing thousands of something. Uh, we pretty much have the inventory for the knee that I'm using or the hip that I'm using for all of Suffolk County. You know, uh, so if they were missing it someplace else, they were on Krauss has yeah. got it over there, Picard could send a messenger over. You know, uh, so we're, we're using uh, millimeter for millimeter uh, implants. Um, and uh, you know, I can talk about the materials, I don't know how much more I should, do you have another question? I have two more questions. Um, one comment also, if we could just speak a little louder, there was somebody having difficulty hearing. Um, so somebody is asking a general joint question. They want to know if ankle replacements are done at this facility, at Peconic. Yes. So uh, Dr. Segal, or Siegel, depending how you want to pronounce it, you know, uh, uh, who's been uh, associated with me and has been working with me, uh, for nearly 20 years, just a super well, super trained guy. Actually, historically, when I see you want to be an expert in a bigger and bigger area, I had two fellowships after, I mean, he's already practicing for 20 years. But, you know, two fellowships, one in hip and knee replacements, which he does as well as any of us, I mean, or better. Uh, and, but he does ankle replacements. Uh, he had a special fellowship in foot and ankle surgery. Um, that's very, uh, complex foot and ankle reconstructions uh, and does uh, ankle replacements. I uh, did one here not too long ago. Uh, just uh, and, and there the technology has changed. If you were going to have an ankle replacement five or ten years ago, I would tell you don't, don't do it. Have the ankle fused. But today, technology is excellent. Great. And then one final question. There's somebody here who has already seen um, one of the orthopedic surgeons here at Peconic Bay, and she is um, one of those patients who's terrified to have the surgery. So she said, um, 
Is there any, are there any words of encouragement um, for someone like her? She's scared of the general anesthesia um, and is scared to be intubated during the surgery. Okay, so. Well, if you, you may have joined a little bit later then because we did go through that with Dr. Krauss. So, uh, uh, Not a fear. Yeah. 99.999% of patients we do under regional anesthesia. You do not need to be intubated. You do not need uh, general uh, anesthesia. It's uh, just like when you go to the dentist and it makes your nerve root numb. It's a little bit of Novocaine on the front and on the back. If it's a hip replacement, it's just a single shot at the, just above the buttocks. Uh, uh, and the hip, it's, and the knee is both front and back, so the knee is numb. And we give people a little bit of sedation, like when they're having a colonoscopy. They can be, you know, sleeping away, but not in a coma, not under general anesthesia, without a tube and a respirator, they feel comfortable. We're not knocking off brain cells and we're not making people, you know, uh, uh, confused when they wake up. They're, they're comfortable. As the, as the um, joint technology and, and innovations uh, carry fo forward, in parallel, anesthesia techniques have also um, improved and uh, the medications that they use are, are, are better, they, they, they last longer, less side effects. Um, I would suggest that you um, go, go back, speak to your um, orthopedic surgeon. Perhaps um, he or she could connect you to one of their patients and you could speak and get a good sense of you know, what it felt like from the patient perspective. Um, taking this joint replacement journey, um, I think uh, most people will like, like almost everything in medicine, I can say even with a cardiac catheterization or a stent, the, 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 the fear of going in, um, when it's done, you're like, oh my God, I wasted all that energy um, being anxious about this. And it really was um, a, a very you know, straightforward path, the re recovery. And, and, and literally, when people have their joints replaced, even though they have post-operative surgical pain, their arthritic pain is gone, and it feels miraculous. You know, uh, I'm not sure the patient needs a hip or a knee. Many people with hip replacements tell me that, you know, I feel better today than I did yesterday, uh, you know, the day after. E even with their post-op. E even with their post-op. Yeah, it's not so painful. It, it, it's uncomfortable at times, and some people say they never had any pain, but some people, yes. But the, the, the anesthesia today is small things that prevent you from getting pain and nausea and so on preemptively, you know, before, before you get those things. So we're preventing a lot of the pain, a lot of the nausea, a lot of the discomfort from coming. Um, and general anesthesia is, generally speaking, a, a real rarity. We know ahead of time what, what is necessary. I would be surprised if this patient needs general anesthesia. Thank you. So we're coming up to the end of our hour, which blew by, so uh, we, spend another hour. <laughs> we, we, we can bring you back. But um, for those of you out there, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dr. Krauss, you're, um, I can listen to your stories all day long, and so we should think about getting you back. I think there's more questions, but um, if you have any questions, please post them on, um, on the Peconic Facebook page. We will get the questions to Dr. Krauss or to any of our, um, you know, any of my colleagues, our colleagues here, um, to get them answered for you. Uh, we, that's why we're doing this. We want to be really present for all of you, answer your questions um, in real time if possible. Um, if you have any suggestions for other areas of um, medical care that we should talk about, post that as well. We'd love to be responsive to all of you. Um, so thank you you're, you're so much thank, thank you for, for your time uh, thank you so much and, you are, and everything that you've done well, here it's, for this it's, it's hospital, the community. It's, it's great joy. And thanks to all of you for joining us. So uh, we'll, we'll see you, you um, next week. Thank you.